This program shows drugs being made, sold, and used. It features graphic content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. A junkie escort. That's how I marketed as a slamming uh, leather whore. That's what I have to be if I want to keep the money coming. I have to have more drugs. Like I'm panicking right now because this is gonna be the last of it right here. Colby has been using crystal meth for 13 years. Now he injects himself three times a day. I shoot it about half a gram at a time. Most people that do that would be just like out of their mind. It usually doesn't cost me too much because I usually trade my ass for drugs. If I had to buy it, probably about like 150 a day. So it's like pure ecstasy over your whole body, and you immediately just feel like really sexual and like just really just like an animal. A lot of gay people do it to just have sex parties. It's easy to find in the gay community. If I want to do it, I just offer to have sex with who knows, who, who cares. The epicenter of the 60s psychedelic revolution, San Francisco is notorious for drugs. But in the new millennium, the summer of love has become the winter of addiction. And in the heart of the city, the gay community is struggling to recover from a meth epidemic. It's all over the streets. You can get it anywhere. An entire subculture known as party and play is based around methamphetamine use. Gay websites are used to arrange meetings with strangers to take crystal meth and have sex, sometimes for days on end. I get on five different websites, and I'll just go from one to the next. You see an ad, and it's got the T capitalized, and you know that they're partying or whatever. If it says blowing clouds, which is smoking it, but let's get to the point. It means they're, they're into slamming it. And it's usually always associated with sex. Colby is HIV positive, but his life still revolves around sex and meth. There's just something about it. it goes hand in hand with being gay. I can't remember the last time I've had sex without it. It's almost ready. Colby charges $200 an hour specializing in the most extreme fetishes. There's a guy I know, he sends me money just for drugs, sometimes $1,000 at a time, but he wants it only spent on crystal meth. I, in exchange, make videos of me shooting up. That's what turns him on the most. He spends his earnings on drugs and lives homeless on the street, only renting a room when he needs to shoot a video. Yeah. Ah. Ah, damn it. Ah. In low doses, meth increases energy. Oh, I didn't get all of it. I don't want to waste it either. In higher doses, it can induce euphoria. It's extremely like hot, hot feeling. Um, I feel good. I'm gonna try to get the rest of this in. That was a big one. The initial high is known as the rush. Normally I would be playing with myself. That's what I generally do right after 
I usually have guys around ready to me. Once the rush has subsided. I'm very antsy. Like, I get very antsy. I don't want to, I can't sit still. The adrenaline-like effects kick in. Ooh, I have a lot of energy right now. I just want to. <laughs> oh, man, I just. My mouth is like extremely dry all of a sudden. My head hurt. Just a little bit would keep me up like three days. You can't eat, you can't sleep. Oh, I've been up for eight days before. As the meth takes hold, addicts' lives fall apart. I used to make straight A's. I was always like student of the year, didn't do any drugs. Went to church all the time. Now I am homeless, a prostitute, a major junkie. It's out of control. It's like I cannot stop. It's killing me. That destroys lives, man. But that's the choice they make. The Asian cartel has been poisoning San Francisco with meth for almost 25 years. We started the Shab movement here in the Bay Area. And it all started really in South the Market. We were the first ones to get the process done. Before, they just had like a lot of raw crank. We would process it, take it through a vacuum pump, clean it, wash it and it came out like shards. You had one shard that was like probably as big as a plate. Once cooked, the Asian cartel's product is distributed by car to one of their six safe houses within the city. The areas that we pretty much take care of, you know, the Tenderloin, South of Market, the Sunset, the Richmond area. San Francisco is 44% Asian, so we have a big market here. We're 50 strong in this one particular operation, and we're all over the city. The Asian cartel run two meth super labs in the city. One is over 10,000 square feet. They're producing 20, 30 pounds a week. The amount of money that they're making is, is pretty large. Anywhere from a million to three. In San Francisco's meth trade, there's very little peace and love. Out of 10 dealers, maybe two will survive through all the That's if they're really, really lucky. We're about our bread. As long as you don't put our money, then we're good with you. We ain't got no problems with you. Like ninjas of the American underworld, the Asian cartel prefers to remain hidden in the shadows. We don't stand on the street corner. That's just not who the we are. That, to us, is just sheer stupidity. You get the guy, he might get caught with like an eighth, and pretty soon, he's going to start giving more up. Why go to the pen when you can send a friend? That's the ideology of other races. That's not our ideology. But if you have the good shards or good shabu or good glass, your product speaks for itself. You don't need to look for clients. But the Asian cartel's grip on San Francisco's meth trade is under threat. The secret of their cooking process has gotten into the wrong hands. A couple of our guys showed some of the Mexicans on how to cook, which it all up for all of us. The Mexican cartel, they just cut through the chase, and they just started making crystal on their own. Now the Mexican cartels are intent on taking over. Super labs hidden in the depths of Mexico have perfected the process of industrial meth production, flooding the streets of San Francisco with super strength meth at a fraction of the cost. Chronic meth use is on the move. Once the party drug popular on the rave scene, 
Crystal meth is now so cheap, it's replacing crack as the favorite high of the down and out. Only a few miles from the Castro, hordes of meth addicts gather in one of the worst drug ghettos in the whole of America, the Tenderloin. San Francisco has a significant drug problem. You only need to walk through the Tenderloin to see that. It's probation's job to keep recently released prisoners on the straight and narrow. But in a city saturated with meth, it's not easy. A lot of our clients hang out in the Tenderloin. So yeah, we spend a lot of time rolling around to see if we can make contact. The average age is about 40. The majority of them are male. And so they have had a long history of substance abuse. Today, Christy and David are scouring the tenderloin for a recently released meth addict who's failed to turn up for his treatment. This is one of the blocks where there's a lot of illegal narcotic action. We see a lot of hand-to-hand -hand sales going on. It's really saturated. A 50-block area right in the heart of downtown San Francisco, the Tenderloin, has long been a notoriously violent drug supermarket. But few drugs have caused as much mayhem as meth, and the Tenderloin is plumbing new depths. We've seen an increase in clients that are addicted to methamphetamine. A new strand out on the street is very addictive, and it's causing them to have extreme paranoia. Christie's department is feeling the effects of the recent flood of extra potent Mexican meth on the market. They'll come in convinced that somebody's following them, trying to kill them, and there's really no calming them down. So it's really difficult to navigate that psychosis. As a probation officer, Christie has seen the horrific effects that even short-term meth use can have on the body. Some of our clients develop sores on their face from scratching. Physically, it's a very uh, damaging drug. Hair gets brittle, and they've lost their teeth. It's like literally like zombies. And like zombies, the denizens of the Tenderloin come alive at night. Stoned up like a hit on love. Rolling up that stick, that stick. Smoking on that lie, that lie. Call us black kid, black like kid. Stoned up like a hit on love. Rolling up that stick, that stick. Smoking on that lie, that lie. Call us black kid, black like kid. He just took a hit right here on the block. And you can go up this street and you'll see lighters going. All of them standing out here taking their last little hits. Some of them then picked up off the ground, don't know whatever it is. They tweaking so hard out here. Somebody told me when I first moved here a couple months ago, people don't come here to live, they come here to die. I'm hoping that I don't make that statistic true, you know? I got my addictions and it's tough out here. A lot of us been tricked and thinking, thinking selling dope and all of that is the American dream. It's not. <clears throat> it's feeding our penal system. That's the only outlet that we have is to sell drugs. Prostitution for the women, drugs for the men. This is the destruction of the whole community right here. This footage from a safe house in the heart of the Tenderloin was shot by a gang member. Let's kill that dog, man. That's how we living, man. That's guy they call it, man. You see that there, man? On the street, this pound of crystallized Mexican super meth is worth almost one hundred thousand dollars. We got this, man. This is what it is, man. We eat, man. Look at that job, man. Come on, man. Let's work, man. Look at that job, man. Come on, man. We got this, man. This is what it is, man. Heading up a sizable operation is Chi. I'm manufacturing crane. Crystal, cheese, I mean, whatever you choose to call it. I mean, we got a nice little operation going on here.
Crews like Cheese are receiving industrial strength raw meth from Mexico, which they manufacture into crystals. You did that, man. Them shards, man. A process known as re rocking. You did that, man. That's great. That crystal right there, man. They churn out 10 to 15 pounds every single week. That ain't much to some guys, man, but uh, it's enough for us, man. It's enough to supply not just the tenderloin, but also Daly City, the largest city in neighboring San Mateo County. We're doing that on a weekly basis, man. You're looking at 100,000 or better, man, on the minimum. It depends on how we serve it, man, but bottom line, man, uh, we don't see them six digits and we don't see nothing else, man, because that's what we're striving for. An operation like this requires some serious muscle. And we got 15 to 20 plus on the payroll. That's about the size of our mob. It's 15 to 20 of us, but, uh, yeah. You all right up in there? Yeah, we all right, bro. Good looking out, bro. Safety, that's first and foremost. Born into the drug trade, she puts the success down to experience. It's what I was born to do. This is all I ever known. It's all I was ever raised around, all I ever seen in life. So uh, I guess the that's why I make me so good at what I do, man. That's why we eating around here, man. And probably speak for itself, man. It's the taste on there, man. By using crews like Cheese to flood the streets with cheap industrial super meth, the Mexican cartels have succeeded in creating a whole new market for their product. That's right, man. San Francisco's fine, man. We eat, man. To supply their new market, the Mexican cartels have established a drug superhighway that runs from the Mexican border towards the Bay Area, injecting meth right into the heart of San Francisco. But there's one choke point, and that's where Sergeant Bonzel is waiting. I would say 95 to 98 percent of the methamphetamine in this area comes from Mexico across the border. Bonzel copies, and I'm uh, headed back to uh, our location. Sergeant Bonzel and his team are working to infiltrate and disrupt the cartel's distribution network. It's painstaking and risky. Today, we're strictly doing surveillance on a mid-level distributor. This particular target is picking up uh, anywhere from a pound to a half a pound of methamphetamine every three days. Today, we're just trying to make our suspect go into the door that we believe that uh, he's living. The cops suspect the dealer is using his transgender roommate's apartment as a stash house. According to our source, he's putting out about $4,000 every three days. So he's probably making a couple of grand profit a week. So he's paying his bills. If the cops can confirm that this is where the dealer is staying, a judge will issue a warrant for a raid. The sergeant also has intel on the dealer's car. Copy, I got four 620. We're expecting an arrival of a black Mercedes um, that our target drives. It's not here at the target location now, so we're just waiting. To get this information, the team have already flipped a lower level dealer. The sergeant is hoping that busting this dealer will take them even higher. Our main objective is to go up the ladder. Eventually, it'll work to the cell boss of the cartel, whoever's providing those narcotics down the line. He may be only a mid-level dealer, but Bonzel suspects that he could lead them all the way to the Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloans use the same organizational structure as terrorists. They're very organized. There might be 15 cells of cartel dealers in Northern California. Each one of those cells will have contact with the cartel across the border, but each cell may not know that the other cell's operating. This makes them almost impossible to stamp out. If one cell is caught, it cannot give evidence on another. The cartel in Mexico is sending hundreds of pounds of methamphetamine to these cells to distribute throughout the, all of Northern California. 
Despite being 500 miles from Mexico, the Bay Area is still very much cartel turf. You definitely have cartel-connected people at the top running these um, cells and these organizations on this side of the border. We can keep them out of our area or make it hard for them to operate in our area. That's our goal. Change on point. Copy, no change. Go ahead. The dealer's black Mercedes is not showing. It is now almost 5.15. We've been sitting in these cars for the past six and a half hours with not much action. Just as the cops are on the verge of calling it a night, there's a sign of activity. Point, you copy? Is out. You should have her walk in a southbound black sweater, I think over red shirt, black pants, blonde hair. First, six is it pulling in now? Yeah, I'm seeing that Mercedes coming in. Then within minutes, the black Mercedes arrives. Target vehicle's pulling into the driveway now. We got a driver's side door open. Driver's side door is open. It's critical the team get a 100% ID, so the sergeant sends a detective in on foot. Out of the vehicle. Hood up for disguise. Have him going up the stairs Somebody now. Going up the stairs. But if the target gets suspicious, it could blow the entire operation. Firm, you have eyes on the suspect. Uh, make the door, and we're good. Happy, I got him going in the door now. After nine hours of surveillance, the team can finally link the suspect to this address. It took a lot longer than we thought it was going to take, but our search warrant is ironclad. We have to make sure that we get somebody else behind bars. For the moment, the drug superhighway remains wide open and raw super meth from Mexico is pouring into the Bay Area. Once the meth is re-rocked in local stash houses, it's distributed to street dealers back in the Tenderloin. My office is located on the corner of Turk and Medwork. And I guess you could say my job is make money and get high. I buy wholesale and I sell retail. Bio has been dealing in the Tenderloin for over 30 years. What I do is called supply and demand. I supply what's in demand, and that's how I survive. His career has followed drug trends. In the 80s, he sold Coke. In the 90s, it was crack. In the 2000s, he slung smack. Nowadays, he's shifting more and more crystal meth. What we have here is a bag of crystal. They call it TT here in San Francisco. Crystal now is one of the cheapest products out there. Bayou pays $800 for half an ounce at wholesale. And makes 700 profit. Dealing funds, Bayou is crippling addictions to crack, meth, and heroin. I spent 300 a day in heaven. This piece here is what I choose to call my personal, because won't nobody get this one here. This is one in my buttocks. They say once you go black, you don't go back. Ooh, look at that, that look pretty. <laughs> like a pretty woman. Now you see it? Now you don't. But like most dealers in the Tenderloin, He's working just to keep the withdrawals at bay. If I could have a breakfast, this would be my breakfast. Breakfast on a Brillo, I call it. <laughs> That's pretty much what my life consists of. I smoke, I poke, and I get money. With the streets of San Francisco awash with Mexican super meth, the number of addicts and dealers is higher than ever. San Francisco is pioneering a new system called the realignment. Street-level drug criminals remain in the community, where they are encouraged through treatment into jobs by probation officers like Christy and Tommy. We approach it with a social work philosophy. At the same time, we have to be concerned for our safety.
With the new strain of super meth on the streets, users can be more irrational and violent than ever. Today, Christy and Tommy are hunting down a meth addict who's failed to turn up for his treatment. We don't know what we're going to encounter. We don't know who else is in the room. But all the officers in my unit will be armed. Most probationers are housed in cheap hotels in the Tenderloin. Right back in the middle of the drug hell, many are trying to escape. Hey! Morning. Hey. Do you have anything in here you're not supposed to have? Uh, name some stuff I'm not paraphernalia. I got you, sweetheart. I'll take it from here. Got some needles and a little tie off there. And a little push. This torch. This is the lighter. Yeah, but what are you using it for? For my cigarettes. So when's the last time you used? Oh, two days ago. OK. My issue is that I can't let the taxpayers think that we're providing a free room to you so that you can just get high. So if you want to gather up your stuff from the shower here, we're gonna, you're going to go down there with us. Take me to jail? Sir, if I was going to take you to jail, I'd tell you that. Under the new system, the probation officers are on a mission to get him off drugs, not back in a cell. We're going to take him over to the Department of Public Health and get him into some outpatient treatment today. Like many of San Francisco's street addicts, he switched from crack to meth to get more bang for his buck. The crack was no longer getting me high. It's just getting me sick. It's making me sick, make my stomach hurt now. It's all garbage. Most people are using drugs to shield the pain. I've lost everybody in my family. I have no living members that know where I'm at. Don't, they don't even know if I'm dead or alive. And uh, you know, I did 10 years, like 10 years, without having anybody on the planet to send me a stamp to say that we give a rat ass about you. Despite his addiction, David is free to go. He's going to start outpatient treatment. So we feel confident that he's going to address his substance abuse issue. And in turn, he'll get to stay in his room. While the probation department throws out a lifeline, most people caught up in San Francisco's drug trade believe there is no escape. I think I'll never get out the ghetto. I might be stuck here for the rest of my life. I might just die down here. Who knows? It's hard down here. Spider works the tenderloin, collecting money for a drug dealer. The people they don't pay, I rough them up. I might give them a black eye or break their jaw, break a finger, arm. It don't matter. For just $500 a month, Spider has sold his soul. There's a couple of people I had to chase down, and I don't like to run. If I run and I catch you, it's going to be worse, sir. If you don't have it, I got to break something. He's been working the Tenderloin's drug trade since he was 12. When I was young, I used to watch my mother sell drugs, and I just grew into it. I didn't see people get shot out here. I didn't see people get stabbed. I saw the police get beat up. I see people just go crazy. I see people die on the street with needles in their arm. I see people die with crack pipe in their mouth. Be their last hit, and the heart just stop. I've seen it. I've seen it all. Many people in the Tenderloin have lost at least one loved one to the drug trade, and Spider is no exception. This man was coming to make a purchase on some drugs. He came back and shot my best friend. Right in front of my face. Shot the wrong person. That took a lot out of me. Think about him all the time. But life is cheap in the Tenderloin, and it doesn't take much to spark a murder. It could have been $5, 10 $20. Who know? I don't know, even know. Fifty miles south of San Francisco, Sergeant Bonzel has received some urgent intel on their meth dealer. Our suspect got in a fight with his roommate, so the roommate kicked him out. Bonzel has no choice but to execute the search warrant a day early. We just don't want to take the chance of losing our crook. 
They must raid the stash house before their suspect disappears. Talk to that. I'll be uh, coming from east to west. Sergeant Bonzel and his team plan to fake a routine traffic stop on the meth dealer's car. There's our marked unit right here. Uh, we'll be making the car stop for us. Once they've stopped the car, they should find meth in it. Copy, then uh, point, stay where you're at, and I'll be there 30 seconds. This will give them probable cause to raid the suspected stash house. We're waiting for our suspect to leave the house so we can make this car stop. Uh, we would like to make the car stop a few blocks away from here. That way, if anybody else that he knew came by, they, they won't see him. We want it to look like this is a lucky car stop and the guy found narcotics. It's all to protect the informant. By using a traffic stop as a cover, Bonzel hopes to hide the fact that an informant has led them to the stash house. Our is at the black Mercedes. He's got a black duffel bag, and he's putting the duffel bag into the trunk of the Mercedes. And he's getting ready to leave the Mercedes, so that's good news. Looks like he's away southbound. He's away southbound. Bonzel straight on his tail. But the plan's already gone wrong. Okay, the stop was made right there. As soon as he saw the marked unit, the suspect pulled over, forcing the officer to arrest him right outside his apartment. Hey, I may have spotted the uh, lady man on foot. Our transvestite roommate is walking around the corner right now. By chance, the suspect's transgender roommate has stumbled across the scene. Our worry is that the roommate will go uh, into the apartment and start flushing any evidence that might still be upstairs. Hey, where are you at? Copy. It is confirmed on the roommate. She did notice that that is the target's car parked there. She just turned around and headed back towards the apartment. Police fear that if the roommate returns to the apartment, she will destroy evidence. Now their cover is blown. They need to move on the apartment and fast. Find a building and tack up and then hit the house. Any police entry into a meth dealer's house is risky. Sheriff's office search warrant! They are often armed and dangerous. Clear. Clear. Looks like it has already been raided. Clear. Now the search can begin. In the bedroom, just out in plain view, we have found a line of what appears to be crystal methamphetamine um, prepared to be snorted. The team also discovers a hide. But it's empty. Combination safe. Were you able to talk him into a safe code? They desperately need to find more evidence to build a case. At this point, we're waiting for a narcotics canine to come and give us direction where to search and see if we don't miss anything. Oh, boy. No, no, affirmative on the hit on the safe. OK. He hit on the safe. He gave him what's called a positive alert on the safe, meaning there is narcotics or was narcotics in the safe at one point. The dealer has denied any knowledge of the safe. The team is running out of options. Then, a breakthrough. In the suspect's car, they find a hidden compartment. So we got his money here and a hide in the vehicle. One bank roll. Looks like we got another bundle of cash. Good boy! 
it's a narc dog. Dog's not trained to hit on money. It's trained to hit on narcotics. So obviously this money has been hand in hand with narcotics. Unless they find a decent quantity of meth, this dealer will probably walk. This was in the suspect's uh, backpack. And you pull it off and you have a hide. And just right off the bat, you have a methamphetamine pipe. We have his baggies that are gonna be used to package the methamphetamine for sales. And then you have the bulk, what we like to call his stash. The methamphetamine that he has packaged for sale. Finally, they have enough to put the suspect behind bars. Okay. It's like we've got a pretty decent amount, but I think we're gonna find more in the safe that he says he doesn't know anything about. Back at the station, the team finds another use for the battering ram. What is that? There's possible chemicals in there. Anytime we open up the unknown and there's liquid in there and we're dealing with methamphetamine, we're concerned that there's um, chemicals. The chemicals involved in meth production are extremely toxic. It's a meth pipe? A meth? Water. Meth water bomb. That, that fluid will test positive for methamphetamine. That pretty heavy smell. Let's get this out of this enclosed room. In there, I'll set it down. It looks like this dealer has been icing small amounts of raw meth. Coupled with the crystal they found bagged up for sale, it's a useful bust. There's a gram. They charge about $10 a point, and a gram is 10 points. This is 48. I think it could be up to $5,000 worth of narcotics here. We'll see if this will lead us to more. For Bonzel and his team, this dealer could be a crucial link to the top of the chain, the cartel's sale boss. If we're able to get this person source, we would expect to find multiple pounds, and then his guy will have multiple kilos, and that should lead us to the border. While the cops chase the Sinaloa cartel's shadow, San Francisco's Asian cartel is diversifying to capitalize on the Mexican takeover. We have a pretty good relationship with the Mexicans. Offering cartels like the Sinaloa access to their distribution network at a price. We have our own shipping, our own courier service. But we'll charge you $2,000 per P to get to its destination. We just know people at the airport, you know people at the cargo ships. We ship out to New York, Florida, Chicago, and there's quite a few other places as well. The Sinaloa cartel's aggressive expansion into San Francisco is part of a long-term plan, the domination of the entire U.S. crystal meth market. It's much easier to sell out there because the Bay Area, everything is saturated. Everybody's got crystal out here. The Iceman has carved out his own niche. I could be dirty for like 30 minutes, and all you are is a go-to guy, kind of like the middleman, just making things happen. So of course you get stuff intercepted. That's part of the game. You can lose a batch every now and then. For every batch lost, a dozen make it through. The Iceman now gets a cut of business worth billions. If you're shipping, you can make $500,000 in one month. It's night and day. While the cartels rake in the money, the addicts on the street pay the price. Colby's last meth binge ended in a severe come down. I haven't been high in five days, and I've been asleep the entire time. Oh, God, it's been horrible. I have been uncontrollably crying for no reason, really disoriented and dizzy. Forced into cold turkey by lack of funds, 
Colby has just received payment for his last hardcore video. I'm just now starting to feel better from detoxing from the drugs, but I'm gonna start the cycle all over again. Even after the come down has passed, long-term users can remain severely depressed and lethargic for up to a year. For many, the solution is to get back on the meth as quick as they can. 180, all right. And there he is. So that's my dealer. He has the drugs ready, and he's about eight blocks down the street. So I'm very excited. And like, I feel high already just now, just thinking about it. So. Colby knows he should take this opportunity to quit. I was having second thoughts because I feel good. It's been a long time since I've actually detoxed. And today, I was starting to feel better. I could change my mind right now. Should I? No. Given the choice of feeling suicidal or feeling high, for most addicts, the choice is obvious. It took about 20 seconds, and I ended up with this. It's an eight ball. It's about three and a half grams. When you're homeless like Colby, it's easier to score the drugs than it is to find a place to inject them. I'm going to go into this outdoor toilet here and get high. It's very, very hard to get privacy when you're homeless. Now, we gotta watch out for that cleaning cycle. Where is that needle? That's a used one. Oh, shoot. Definitely not the most hygienic place to do this. It's very nerve wracking knowing that there's hundreds of people right outside this door. Yep. Here we go. Much anticipated. Please don't clog. It's starting the cleaning cycle. You need to get out. The toilet folded up, and water was about to start gushing everywhere. You can hear it in there. And I came out with a syringe in my mouth. <laughs> Colby decides to head to the Castro to find somewhere quieter to shoot up. They're always <laughs> locked. <laughs> with so many meth heads around in this city, Everyone locks their porta potties. Yeah, it's locked. It's locked. Forcing addicts to shoot up in the most desperate of places. I'm so freaking paranoid. I should not be doing this at a church, but the siren's going off. Oh, what a life. Ow. That burned that time. My heart's going 90 to nothing. Without the cravings clouding his mind, Colby realizes what his life has become. If my friends and family saw me pulled up in this little corner here shooting up, it would probably break their hearts. But this drug is just, it's, it's gotten a hold of me. And I, I love it and I hate it.